Pelican fans, welcome back to the Midtown Madness podcast with Peter Hale and Zach Miller. I'm Zach Miller. Uh, Pete, uh, quite the weekend, not only uh, for St. Louis University, but uh, uh, quite a few positives and negatives across the Atlantic 10. Yeah, it's been a very up and down, uh, up and down week and uh, looking forward to getting into it. Yeah, I mean, I think first things first, we got to talk about the big news uh, concerning the entire conference, uh, news that I know I was pretty excited for. I'm curious what your uh, your reaction was to Loyola joining the Atlantic 10, officially, I guess. Yeah, I like this. This is something we had talked about as a possibility for years. You know, as SLU fans, we're kind of always caught up in conference changes and always speculating about what might be next. Loyola is always a name we've thrown around too. I think it makes sense for the A-10 for a number of reasons, but um, I I, I think at a high level, this this to me is an ad that's um, a high floor. You know what I mean? Like I don't, this doesn't strike me, you know, even though their facilities could be better, uh, you know, they uh, they are, you know, landlocked in Chicago and everything. Um, They they feel kind of like an A-10 school that way, but, aside from that, I don't think this is a program that's ever going to be like a, a bottom half a 10 program anytime soon. So you mentioned the facilities could be better. One thing I found interesting is they only have three on campus facilities. Yeah. Um, And I've actually seen a game at the, at the men's basketball arena and it's, you know, it's pretty basic. It's, it's fine. It's not bad. It'll do. Um, But it's not, uh, it's not going to knock your socks off if you visit there. Yeah, the interesting thing about uh, Loyola is that they they fund a men's uh, volleyball program and, and a quite a successful one at that. Yeah, yeah, a pro, um, and men's volleyball is not something the A10 has at all. So I'm, I'm assuming they'll they'll still stay in this conference, which is a pretty weird conference when you look at it, by the way. Yeah, the, the, the another uh, sport that they have that the uh, Atlantic Ten does not field. Uh, is golf women's golf I, I I believe I checked it then I could be wrong I may have missed it but last I checked uh, women's golf is not on the list of, of uh, offered or um, you know leagues I guess within the conference um, yeah they have, they have a men's and women's golf team but the A10 only has men's golf I I can't I can't even remember. I remember when they dropped golf, but I couldn't tell you when that what slew I'm talking about now. Yeah. Um, they dropped that and uh I think they just dropped both men's and women's golf for track and field, if I remember. That's right. Yeah, it was kind of in the same time frame when Shafitz was opening up. So a few years after I left campus, I think, um a couple of years into the A10. I don't know if that move was kind of to more align with what the A10 was doing, but um uh, but yeah, regardless, it was it was basically out with golf and in with track. I know uh, I know a lot of Billiken fans like this. Uh, there's two real reasons, uh, two major reasons I think why uh, Billiken fans are going to be happy about this. One, it's geographically favorable to SLU as as another um, uh, geographic rival. Uh, in being that they're in Chicago and then it gives SLU a game in Chicago for both basketball and academic recruiting purposes Uh, as we know uh, many SLU alumni are Chicagoans so um, you know it'll be good that they'll they'll get to see the Billikens play. Yeah I think this is uh, it's a good addition for the whole conference but it's I think it's more beneficial to SLU than probably any other program in the conference for those reasons we've always kind of been this Western outpost in the league. And now we have a pretty natural um, geographic rival, um, not just Dayton anymore. And, um, and it's an even easier road trip than Dayton um, unless Chicago traffic is, is particularly bad that day, but uh, it's an, it's a nice, easy weekend trip. And like you said, there's a ton of, ton of Chicago um, slew alums and students and, uh, and vice versa. I think there's a good amount of, uh, you know, St. Louis, people who uh who go to Loyola yeah I, I'm excited about this I don't think uh I I really don't see this ever being a negative um what is interesting is I was perusing uh doing research for the upcoming basketball games uh and 
on the Illinois message board, I noticed uh, they had they were uh, doing a lot of hand wringing about uh, you know the Missouri Valley sucking all this stuff like uh, and, and one of the them posited that there's a lot of talk online and I haven't seen it but there's a lot of talk that this is a stepping stone for Loyola to try to go to the Big East Loyola and SLU both to the Big East within the next five years I thought that was wild because I think I think most SLU fans have kind of have that's so far off the radar i think that's probably wishful thinking at this point i mean jumping from the valley to the big east would definitely be a bigger um a leap so yeah sure it makes sense but we've you know we've we've seen um xavier and, and butler butler who did it within the, the span of one season in the a-10 um we've seen them do it but that was a different time the big east kind of right now has a, a pretty good 20 games home and home schedule with 11 teams. So unless there's pressure on the big East to expand how many markets they're in, um, I, I think it's, I think it's still probably a few years off. The other thing I would add is that, you know, they've already got DePaul, so it's not like a new market for them, Loyola or anything. And, and, and again, returning to facilities, like you said, there's not a lot on campus and what they do have is not necessarily big East level. I mean, they would immediately come into the conference and probably have the weakest facilities in, in the league. So from the big, big East standpoint, I don't know if Loyola's, uh, to me, Dayton would be a more exciting ad um, if I were the Big East, but I don't know all the politics behind it and I don't know what the long-term strategy is. I just, I think that's pretty far off at best. Yeah, did, did we get a quote from Sister Jean though? about the, <laughs> did, did, did they quote her in any of the articles? I, I didn't see one, I didn't see one. Uh, one connection uh, this that Loyola has to St. Louis is that uh, the conference they play in for men's volleyball has Lindenwood and McKendry in it. Yeah, and Quincy, kind yeah. of a lot of uh, familiar names uh, for 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 slew people. It's, but the other teams in there are Ohio State, Ball State, uh, Purdue, Fort Wayne, and Lewis, which is um, just outside of Chicago, a lower division school there. Um, so it's kind of a pretty interesting conference and, and just illustrates that there aren't a lot of uh, men's volleyball programs in the Midwest. Yeah, I, I'm excited about this. Um, and, and I know I can't wait to get at least one road trip to Chicago. I'm sure the, the Shafitzes are excited about this one too. Oh, of course. Yeah, it's, it's great. It's great. This is a really exciting ad for SLU fans. And, uh, you know, we should all be pretty happy about it. The other thing I would add is, if you're just looking at men's basketball, the kind of the flagship money program for the A-10, um, Loyola would have brought up the overall conference rating each of the last five seasons, and, and they would have this year too. So this is, um, this is in recent history been a really strong program. I know a lot of people say, yeah, but now they've got a new coach, young guy, unproven. Porter Moser's moved on to Oklahoma. Can they sustain it? Um, Long term, I, I, I think they're a top half A-10 team for the foreseeable future, if, even with a new coach. I, I just don't see this program tanking when I look at their their roster and their kind of what they're doing recruiting wise. Um, I, they're definitely going to be competitive in the league. So I think people should probably look at them positively over the long term. Yeah, and they would have improved both men's and women's soccer as well. Uh, yeah, that's women, right. Women's soccer was at RPI 46. And men's 98. Yeah. So it looks like we could add another decent uh, game uh, game or two on the men's and women's soccer side. Yeah. And, and women's volleyball just won the, the Valley. Um, and they're the top seed in the Valley tournament. So that's, you know, they probably get thrown into that cluster, um, you know, with Dayton, VCU, and somewhere between Dayton, VCU, and SLU, you know, in that mix. I think they're probably at that level. Oh, you're testing me. You're testing me. <laughs> we'll, we'll get to that later. Uh, men's basketball. Let's get to the reason why most of our listeners actually listen to us babble on. Um, a tough night uh, against Memphis. A 90-74 loss. Uh, not a lot of bright spots, but I think everyone was talking about TJ Hargrove in this one. Yeah, Hargrove had a really big game here. Um, he really competed hard and uh i don't you know if you had told me that he would have 23 field goal attempts 
I would go, oh, wow, what's going on? <laughs> like, that's a that's a pretty weird number. But he does end up with 20 and 11 in this one. Ships in a, a steal, a block, and an assist. And he played 36 minutes of just really high-energy, active basketball. Um, I think kind of Ford looked and, and, and at the matchups here and how this game was going and just had a hard time taking TJ off the court. I think I, I think I thought I, I want to get your take, but I, I really thought this game was kind of encompassed by the, the quote from Keanu Reeves and the replacements, uh, his quicksand speech. Uh, if you remember that one, I mean, it really felt like the Billikens were in this game. They made plays on defense early. They had opportunities and they could not finish at the rim. They missed free throws. And as they tried to press and press, they just sank further and further. Uh, and Memphis kept piling it on and, and it was just uh, insurmountable. Yeah. I mean, aside from the quote from the replacements, which I, I do, I do not remember. I don't oh, think I ever saw that. What Sorry. A great, one. Uh, <laughs> great movie. I'll take your word for it. Um, yeah. When you, when you look at the first, ah, I want to say six or so six or seven minutes of this game, you kind of saw how we could win and stay in it. Um, it's just that it so happens that our shots were not going in at all, whether we were missing bunnies at the rim or, I mean, in this game, dunks, we were missing dunks, um, settling for maybe not the best three-point attempts. Um, if you if you kind of thought, okay, if a few more of those go in, you see how we can be competitive in this one. We were forcing them to turn it over a lot, something we did, I think, pretty much throughout the whole game. Um, but after that, they're – their combination of size, athleticism, and what I wasn't really prepared for, pressure, um, just really, really got to slew. When I saw Collins settle for an, like an 18, 17, 18 foot step back, fade away, long two, I just thought like, that's, it's such a bad shot. It's not his game. He's frustrated. Um, everybody's frustrated and settling for bad shots because they were having such a hard time getting good shots off against this team. Yeah. It was, I mean, they, he, they were face guarding Yuri Collins from the moment he stepped on the court. Um, I, I really wish we could have seen a few more, you know, uh, backcourt ball screens, um, kind of the, the Conklin screen, if you will, from, from Washington. Uh, we didn't see any in that game. Uh, we saw quite a few uh, in the most recent game. So, I mean, I don't know if maybe that's an adjustment that was made eventually or just kind of, uh, you know, uh, a coincidence. No, I mean, I think I think that's a really good observation, actually. I think you're right. I, the other thing is they were they were putting two guys on trapping him basically as soon as he would cross the timeline and knowing that he's he's not a big guy and they were they would take two much larger guys and they were forcing him into forcing him out of his game, forcing him into turnover, something we almost never see from Yuri um, and clearly getting to him, but it wasn't just him. They were every time um, we, we were in the lane, it was just a, it was a forest and Linson and Okoro and ev basically everybody inside was missing layups, missing putbacks, missing dunks, but it wasn't just in a vacuum. I mean, they were really being, being pressured, being uh, double teamed, and uh, I got I give Memphis a lot of credit for what they they threw at SLU to to really force us into a just awful shooting night from every spot. Yeah, super inefficient. And and you talked about an awful shooting night. I, I think the the that conversation begins uh, with Jordan Nesbitt, three for fourteen from the field, two of six from the three point from three point range. And five of eight from the free throw line. And that two, those two from three point range did, didn't come until way late. Yeah. Same with a lot of those free throws too. He, he went to the line a few times uh, in garbage time, basically. But yeah. I, we, we, we talked about him last game. It was kind of like, okay, what this is a, this game is clearly a big deal for him. He's got a lot to prove. And uh, does he come out, um, you know, doing exactly the, the, the best of reaching the best of his ability, showing them, what he can do or does he kind of get frustrated and force things and I don't know if it was necessarily frustration but he definitely forced things and um wasn't taking or making good shots 
Um, you know, I think he, uh, he was kind of forced into some, um, you know, some, some traps and just, they could, they just completely took him out of his game there in the first half. I want to talk about Memphis because I mean, we can harp on, on, on the Billikens and, and how poorly they play, but man, I mean, this Memphis team turned the ball over 24 times yeah, and they still kicked our ass. Well, we, we, we looked at their turnovers and, and we're like, Hey, they're turning it over like 18 times a game. This, this is kind of a key here if we could do that. So again, if you told me they're going to turn it over 24 times in this game and everybody on the team, except like three dudes are going to have multiple turnovers. I would go, Oh, okay. Like we clearly executed here. And, uh, and maybe this was a closer game than, than we thought it would be. But <laughs> when you talk about this Memphis team, there's so much size, so much talent. It's just, just incredible. Um, Amani Bates is the real deal, you know, played 26 minutes, 16 points. And even though he did turn it over a lot, yeah, it was a little sloppy. He's young. He's, I think he's young for his class too. He's a freshman. He's going to be a lottery pick. I actually think he's too young to be uh, drafted this spring. I think he has to wait another year to give you an idea, but uh he and Jalen Duran, it's just just an incredible amount of talent that this team has. Yeah, I want to throw a number out at you. Uh, six, the number of blocks St. Louis University had. Also, the number of blocks Jalen Duran had in this game. And I think that that six for Jalen Duran feels low because of how many shots he disrupted. Like, think of, think of how many... Uh, shots we got off that weren't clean necessarily because he was there frustrating them and again that dude's a freshman I mean he's really big really really smart player what he was able to to force our big men into and anybody else who went to the rim yeah I I mean look I I think this game you know I I don't know what else we can say I mean is there anything you you saw that I maybe didn't that I didn't put the the only other thing I want to add I mean I think we've kind of given like the reasons as to why we're just kind of overpowered in this one but we were never really completely out of it until the shortest guy on the court Tyler Harris on their team buried like three three three-pointers in a row and all of a sudden um, Memphis kind of has us at arm's distance and then just blew it open. And he wound up only going four for five from three. It felt like he hit more like six or seven of them just because of, um, just because of when they came and, and what they did to the, you know, to the, the score at the time, they re- they really opened it up. So um, I don't, even though I don't think he played as big a role in all of the, the things that, um, that made, slew play so poorly and 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 that they beat us in it was those three pointers just boom 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 um when he hit them that that kind of blew this one open so he was kind of the the little sneaky x factor here yeah i really think we were and i I don't want to sound like an idiot here but i often do anyway so why not um i really think if if we if we don't, if we avoid missing the bunnies that we missed, I mean, we're in this game. Yeah. Oh, I, for sure. We missed so many um, close shots in the first half. It, it was, it was funny. I'm laughing because three times in the first half, we got blocked by the rim on dunks. Yeah. Well, because like it's, it doesn't happen in a vacuum, right? I mean, they've been hit by three different guys going to going through the lane. Jalen Duran's right there, just trying not to foul. And by the time you get to the rim, it's like, oh my god, can barely lift your legs off the ground. Um, so it wasn't just like we had wide open dunks that they just biffed. I mean, they were exhausted trying to get there. It, it was tough to watch late in that game. I mean. You know, I think a lot of uh, the struggles fell on Fred Thatch's shoulders for, you know, whether right or wrong. I mean, he just looked ugly in this game. Yeah, he came out and it just he just didn't have it. I don't know what was going on. Um, I know he hadn't been off to the best start in general this year. I think one of those three bye games last week he was pretty good in and, and, and two of the other three he really wasn't. Um, but this game, when he was out there, it was just like, okay, it's not your night, man. Um, next guy up. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, I think I think we I, and I think the Billikens do a good job of turning the page on this one. Um, yeah, uh, we'll, we'll move on to uh, Saturday afternoon's game against Mercer, part of the Cancun Challenge. Uh, the Billikens are on their way to beautiful Mexico, uh, but they came away against Mercer with a 75-58 win. Uh, what, what stood out to you first and foremost in this game? I think I know what you're going to say, but uh, tell, tell me what you thought. Uh, I don't know if you are actually, because really the thing that I was thinking about the most was I just didn't like our defense in the first half at all. And I'm sure, uh, I'm sure, you know, coach Ford didn't either. I didn't, this was unfortunately one of those games that I was kind of at a, at a family function being a jerk and watching on my phone. So I didn't necessarily get the best uh, full game experience, but um, you know, I mean, at the same time, Mercer, I don't know how they were only six of 26 on the game from three. It feels like they kind of hit them all early on. Yeah. Um, you know, they were five of 15 in the first half and they must've gone like five one, of seven to open it or something like yeah. that. And then one for 11 in the second half. Yeah. Yeah. So that, I mean, that, that's it because it, it just feels like in the first half they hit, they hit a bunch and, and slew, uh, you know, we were down, I mean, it, it was close, but we were down a good chunk of that first half trading leads. Um, so I was a little, I was kind of a little frustrated. I felt like our, our transition defense was a little weak and we were kind of leaving um, good looks for them. So, so what did you think I was going to say or what stood out to you? I mean, Fred Thatch, uh, just, I, I think it speaks to his maturity level uh, to, to have a game like he did against Memphis and then turn around, play 28 minutes, eight and nine from the field, missed his only three point shot, went four of six at the line, uh, pulled down eight rebounds. He gets 20 points and, and three steals. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he, he rescued the Billikens from what could have been, what, what looked to be uh, a potential disaster after about five minutes. Yeah, I mean, you're you're absolutely right. I wasn't thinking this of this in terms of just one player, but Fred, uh, yeah, of course. Like coming off that that rough night at Memphis and kind of a slow start to the season, and not to mention all of the chatter. I I don't know how much these guys see, um, but, but I I was seeing on you know Twitter message boards, even in text message from a couple of buddies, like, hey, is he all right, man? Is this like what's going on here? Is this long COVID or is he um, still suffering the effects of that illness that kept him out the year before? Uh, what's going on here? Um, and then of course he comes out and looks uh, like a world beater, um, just grabbing offensive boards and, and scoring at the rim and just, he looked really tough. Um, so all credit, like you said, I mean, that's just the mark of experience and leadership and, and toughness just coming out and, performing like that and I, I think there's one person on this team that that needs to maybe take a look at what Fred did there and, and the way he turned around turned his his you know week around and I think that's Jordan Nesbitt um uh, 15 minutes didn't see the court in the final 10 minutes of the game uh doesn't make a field goal in this one goes one of two at the line two fouls two assists one turnover you know, I know he's a guy who does not, um, he can be a little uh, mercurial is the word, you know, he's, he's emotional, he's up and down. Um, but I don't think he's a guy that necessarily needs to be the one shooting all the time. I think he's also happy to distribute. He likes to be involved. Um, I don't know what was going on in this one. Um, he, it's not like he got into foul trouble. I think, I don't know, maybe he just didn't have the right, uh, the right frame of mind coming out of that Memphis game or something. Yeah. It, I honestly forgot he existed. Um, mm -hmm. Not to be mean, but like, I, I it, it didn't even occur to me that he wasn't even in the game. Yeah. Uh, well, he only played 15 minutes. Right. I mean, I, I don't think I noticed that he was gone. And I, and I think that says a lot about Fred and, and the way he played. Um but it, I mean, it also may have to do with just like what, what, what I was saying earlier, the fact that Mercer was, um, he, he must have been the guy, I need to go back and, and watch that first half again, but maybe he's the guy who's blowing those assignments that's giving them kind of so many open looks from three in the first half. Um, I, Mike Ford is normally a guy 
who's um, making his decisions based on defense and not offense. And my guess is that Nesbitt was just not doing what he had to do defensively in that first half and just didn't see the floor much after that. Yeah, he doesn't have the uh, the high mark uh, tag that Gibson Jimerson has. And, and, yeah, speak, not yet. And, and, and a perfect transition way to go, Zach. Uh, Gibson Jimerson, my goodness. Uh, is there... A, I am trying to think of a guy who transformed his, the perception of his game more than Gibson Jimerson over the last two years. Yeah. You know, coming in and being thought of as just a spot shooter and, and yeah, he was great at that, you know, the first, the first season here, but um, he's really asserted himself in more spots on the floor for sure. Um I think you said it against Memphis too. Like he, he didn't, he didn't really get many good looks in that one, but it's not, it wasn't for lack of effort. You know um, I, there are times where he's been accused of just kind of standing on the perimeter and waiting for the ball. And I don't think that was the case. He was really trying to get open. And you guys, and I think people got to remember that. I mean, sometimes Gibson standing in the corner waiting for the ball is spacing the floor. Yeah. I mean, because it keeps defenses honest. You have to you have to be ready for that at all times. Yeah, I, I just I really love the the addition of the backdoor cut, which he had. Again, he's shown flashes of that, but um, his ability to get to the hoop and get fouled too. Yep. Uh, I think getting fouled is one of his more underrated uh, attributes, especially when he's lethal from the free throw line. A hundred percent. And I'm going to throw out another great transition here. Let's talk about the free throw line and Francis Okoro. It's so nice to have a big man, a big man who can get it done from there. I know we said that last year with Linson when he came in, uh, but now having, having the the two bigs um, just really getting it done from the free throw line, five of six for Okoro. That's where he got five of seven of his points. Um, Man, is that a relief? Yeah, I noticed. Uh, yeah, I, I just, I, it's so weird. It, it, it's, it's honestly get. I think you want to talk about like the increase in scoring early on in the season. I mean, it may solely be the fact that we have decent free throw shooting numbers now. Like yeah. that's a that's a bump of five to ten points. It was it was very easy for teams to just foul. Goodwin and French and whoever else they wanted, knowing that we were going to shoot 50, 55% from the line and, and they'll take that um, over the course of a game for sure. Uh, can't do that anymore. We've got, uh, we've got free throw shooting that keeps teams honest. Yeah. I, I, Yuri Collins, uh, 33 minutes in this one, three eleven from the field, one of one from three, a big three for him. I thought. Yeah, it was, it was great. And the three of 11 from the field, I, a little frustrating because I thought a lot of those were some pretty good looks. I thought he was um, not, he took good shots. He just missed most of them. It wasn't like Memphis where he was being forced into crappy shots. Um, so some nights that just happens and he gives you seven assists and uh, uh, turned it over a little more than, than we're used to, but um, you know, so not his best night, but at the same time, yeah. He got it done. Yeah, I I really liked this this you know who I'm speaking of things I really like. I really liked DeAndre Jones's 13 minutes in this game. Yeah, he's I, a. I don't have a specific stat to give you for the, for liking it, other than he didn't turn the ball over once. I, it felt like he was able to come in uh, and, and spell Yuri Collins and. When Yuri Collins was having a tough time uh, from the field, uh, DeAndre Jones came in and kind of gave him some time off the ball and allowed him to uh, maybe uh, not be hassled the entire game. This is kind of exactly who I thought he would be, like this kind of game. This was 12 plays, 12 or 13 minutes, gets a few assists, um, gets a look from three. This one didn't go in, but, you know, we know he can shoot pretty well from three. Um, this is kind of exactly the, the, the role I kind of thought he'd be playing on this team. One peculiar thing I wanted to ask you about Mark High Strickland, uh, mm-hmm. plays zero plus he came in for 1.5 seconds 
at the end of the first half what what is the what do you think the motive is for for putting him in there is it length or foul trouble just making sure somebody doesn't fall, like linson or uh uh Okoro get a foul there i i don't I'm try it, it uh let me think here what was the play that would have ended the half it was uh inbounds i think for uh for mercer yeah so okay so this kind of reminds me of was he on the the ball? I don't recall at the end of the half. Was no, he, the... he was down at, near the uh, the three point line. They threw okay. it in, and it was uh, they threw it in, and it was grab like it was grabbed near the the the, uh, the free throw line extended, and he, he missed it. So this is it wasn't the same situation that I was thinking of, where it was kind of an end of game situation and a close game, and. Soderbergh brought Bryce Hushock in because he's seven seven one or whatever and put him on the inbounder and he tips yeah. it and the game ends so it wasn't that but in this situation I think you had probably both of the reasons I think you don't want to put your either of your bigs in a situation where they can pick up um, another well, foul and you also have some length on the perimeter so uh, Mark I came in for Jimerson the, yeah I mean I well did like, Jimerson have two fouls at that point? I mean, again, I'm watching on my, no, at this point, no. I'm watching on my phone in the back seat of a car as we're going to pick up dinner. So uh, my, my recall of this game is limited yeah, uh, I un- I until I get a chance to watch it again. I, I don't think so, but it, interesting enough. I just thought yeah. I'd throw that out. There was just a, it was an odd thing considering Mark rarely plays in close games. Yeah, it, ha- it had to be pure defensive matchup. I mean, they, they missed the attempt off that, right. that inbound. Yeah. Jimerson didn't have any fouls. Right. At yeah. All so the entire game. Excuse me. So guys. it was just a, you know, just to make sure they didn't get a good look. Um, but I, I any any uh, well, I guess we'll talk about the upcoming games. Um, yeah. Then we'll, one one, one last point on that one. Another double double for uh, T.J. Hargrove, and uh, yeah. you know, if he's not careful, he's going to be the last double double machine from East St. Louis. Tommy Liddell um so uh you know i i wouldn't mind to see him uh go on a little run like tommy did that that one season where he had like eight double doubles in a row yeah i, I really like this new uh tj hargrove we're seeing you know um i i would really love to see more plays run for him similar to what they run for jimerson uh his shot is so pretty yeah yeah he's really really improved that and um just really asserting himself all over the floor um coming up Tuesday the Billikens will take on uh, Illinois State on 1123 uh, this is again a part of the Cancun challenge the game's actually in Cancun I believe the game will be on CBS Sports Network um, Illinois State's two and two on the year uh, uh, they are coming off a season in which they went seven and 18 four and 14 in the Missouri Valley uh, their head coach is Dan Muller uh, they're coming off a 105-100 win versus Bucknell. Uh, and they're averaging 84 points a game. Quite a number, Pete. Yeah. Um, part of that is because, well, they've played two overtime games, and the one against Eastern Michigan that they lost went into double overtime. Okay. So the, the, the 98 against Eastern Michigan in a loss and then 105 in a win against Bucknell, you know, they're also – so yeah, they're they're averaging over a hundred there, but they're also allowing over a hundred in both of, in those games. So the other two games, they're scoring a more down to earth sixty five and sixty eight. Um, you know, they've played a halfway decent schedule, and they're two and two against it. Which you know, I would have thought maybe they go one and three against this uh, this particular lineup, um, just because this is a team that was at the bottom of the valley last season, and they're kind of in transition. Um, in transition this year uh, so I, I don't um i didn't have very high expectations so i, I actually think they're kind of outperforming so far um it, but no i don't i don't think this is a team that's going to score that much all season uh one one familiar face uh, this i think this is going to become a a, a a theme uh it seems like we're always coming up against former a10 players and uh, Illinois State has a, a, a face that Billiken fans will be familiar with. That's Cy Chapman. Uh, he's 
a transfer from UMass. Uh, the last time we saw him was uh, January 9th, 2019. It was that three point win uh, kind of went down to the uh, uh, kind of went down to the wire. Uh, and I think UMass missed a shot at the buzzer to tie. Uh, but he's averaging 18 points and 10 rebounds for uh, Muller's uh, Redbirds. Yeah, he, he was always kind of a, a pesky player for SLU. Um, I just felt like he was one of those guys you just heard his name a lot when we would play UMass. So um, I guess I guess it'll be fun to see him again. Uh, they're led by 6'6 guard Antonio Reeves. What can you tell uh, Billiken fans about Mr. Reeves. Yeah, well, I think he's probably exaggerating that his height there a little bit on the on the <laughs> roster. Um, he's he's kind of a wiry guard out of high school. Um, still still pretty much so. Um, I can't believe the way he's scoring so far this year. Um, Twenty three points a game. Uh, but but this is a kid who went to Simeon in Chicago. He's a Chicago kid, and and SLU recruited him. I think he actually came down to SLU for a visit at one point. Um, and, and had an offer. I don't know how committable it was or any of the details of that at the time. I just know we recruited him and um, didn't know he would quite evolve into the scorer. But yeah, he's been a really nice player for, uh, for Illinois State, who's, got, who's made a big jump um, each of his three years so far. Um, they are led by a sophomore point guard. Uh, well, the, the offense is run by sophomore point guard Mark Freeman, uh, this guy has the the uh, the capability to go off at any moment. Yeah, I think so. He's tough, tough little guard. Only about five ten. He's out of Memphis, um, but he's uh, I, I think he's a nice player. A little bit, a little bit younger. He's only a sophomore, and um, I think it'll be a tough matchup for for Yuri. You know, he came from from Tennessee State, um, where he was really productive. Uh, so, so at 5'10", 160, he's small, but um, I don't know. I, I, I feel like he's going to give Yuri a bit of a game here. Yeah, it'll definitely be a fun uh, small guard matchup. Mark Freeman's yeah. coming off a 34-point outing in that game versus Bucknell that went to overtime. Uh, so he, he, can, he can fill it up, and uh, it would it'd be fun to see, a, a, um, you know, kind of two point guards going at each other um, on Tuesday night. Yeah, I think the 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 thing with Illinois State, I kind of like a few of the these guys we've mentioned at the top, but I, I don't think they're particularly deep. Um, I think once you go to the bench, it's it's a pretty big drop off for them in terms of talent and uh, and experience. They've got a lot of you know they're, they're big in the sophomore class, um, so they've got a lot of uh, second maybe third year guys who haven't played a whole lot yet. Um, so I think if we can kind of you know, neutralize these, these starters, maybe get them into foul trouble, something like that. Um, you know, Illinois state doesn't have much of a bench. Yeah. And, and depending on, uh, how the Billikens do in the game against Illinois state, they will take on either, uh, Buffalo or Stephen F. Austin, uh, Buffalo, uh, is two and one, uh, last year they were 16 and nine, 12 and five. Uh, they made the NIT first round. Uh, they're uh, they have a head coach uh, who Billiken fans should be very familiar with. Uh, who is that head coach, Pete? Yeah, Jim Whitesell, um, who who you will remember as an assistant um, at, at SLU not too long ago. And honestly, he's been pretty good at Buffalo. This is a solid team every year. That's that's kind of at the top of the MAC, and uh, you know was in the NIT last year. Um, they're kind of always in the mix to, to win that conference and, and, and get the bid. Um, the, they are uh, earlier this season, uh, Buffalo lost to number six, Michigan, um, 88, 76. So they gave them quite a game. So uh, impressive stuff uh, by Buffalo in that one. Uh, Whitesell's not the only familiar face on this team, Pete. Uh, Maceo Jack transferred over there from George Washington. Yeah, and he's averaging close to 14 a game on on 38% three point shooting. I guess the, the good news here is we've seen him a few times already. So um so Slew kind of knows what he can do. The the bad news is is now he has teammates that can beat us. That's yeah, they're I think they are probably a little bit better than George Washington, that's for sure. I think I they have a player who may have my favorite name of 2021-22 season, Jonathan Williams. That's right. 
not Jonathan, Jonathan Williams, six, five forward. Uh, he leads them in minutes, a bit of a stretch forward too. Yeah. And who scores about uh, almost 22 a game. Um, he's a guy, he's another one. And as soon as you said, Jonathan, um, when we were getting ready to, to, to record, I was like, wait a minute. I, cause it, it was with a name like Jonathan, <laughs> you're not going to escape my attention. Um, he was another guy we offered out of high school. He, he, for whatever reason, he's from Rochester, upstate New York. And, uh, and, went to a prep school for his last year out in California and then winds up just going to Buffalo. So I, I don't think he necessarily had to make that. Maybe he just wanted to spend a year in California because, you know, he, he, he easily could have landed at Buffalo out of Rochester, but nevertheless, he's a nice, a nice player, kind of a, a wing forward um, who can, who can shoot it, who can slash um, does a little bit of everything. And he's going to be a tough matchup. Uh, one other note: They are uh, their their offense is run by point guard uh, and senior Ronaldo Segu, uh, a nice little point guard that uh, w- that has plenty of experience. So, uh, should be another matchup, uh, a potentially good matchup, uh, depending on results for Yuri Collins. Uh, they take on Stephen F. Austin, uh, three and one. Uh, Last year they went 16 and 5, 12 and 3. They're they're coached by Kyle Keller. No familiar faces on this team. Uh, they're led by both Gavin Kemsel, Kensmill, uh, a forward averaging almost 16 points a game, and Cameron Johnson, a guard averaging 15.3 points a game. Yeah, this isn't quite the Stephen F. Austin they were with um, Brad Underwood as coach. Um, the three seasons he was there, they they won their conference every year, went to the tournament three times in a row. They were winning like 30 games a year. Um, but nevertheless, under under Keller, they've been a really solid program ever since then. Um, I still haven't quite figured out what's what all the drama was with the Southland Conference basically splitting in half and a bunch of teams from Texas going to the WAC. So they're in the WAC for the first time this year. Um, yeah, like I said, still trying to wrap my head around all that. I didn't even know about that. It's really weird. Yeah, when I was doing some recruiting updates lately, I was like, wait a minute, there were a few conferences down there that blew up and I had no idea and like have already blown up, not just like in, in the, the next year or two, like some of the other ones. Um, but they've got a, you know, they've got a Texas heavy roster and um, they're, they're, they've got some a couple seniors and basically their, their top three players are all seniors. So They've got some experience. I could kind of see this game with Buffalo going either way. Um, I think Buffalo is probably the better team, but I wouldn't be shocked to run into these guys either. Uh, so you, so I was going to ask you, but it sounds like you've kind of uh, made your uh, your thoughts known. Who do you think the Billikens will take on, uh, uh, assuming that we beat Illinois State? Yeah, I, I think it's Buffalo in a close one. Are are you in agreement? Yeah, I, I mean yeah. Buffalo just ha- has the has the uh, has the horses, so to speak. I, I just think they look better, um, and, and I mean they've been the better program over the the last couple of years. Yeah, uh, they've been super consistent, and uh, I think Stephen F. Austin may be a little more of a transition period, uh, even though they did go sixteen and five, twelve and three uh, in conference last season. I, I just I like Buffalo in general. Yeah. Um, Pete, let's talk about the A-10 this week. Mm, do we have to? Uh, I know, I know, <laughs> I know. Um, I mean, we had we had teams winning big games. Uh, we had teams losing bad games. Uh, we had a recruit for George Mason charged with murder. Uh, it's kind of a Charlie Fox trap this week. Yeah, it's been all over the map. I mean, when you starting with this first day, you see Fordham get their second win. Um, and then uh, and UMass beat Penn State. And it's like, OK, you know, we're in pretty good shape here. And then Duquesne loses to Weber State. So it's it, it, that's just like a perfect snapshot of, of what's going on all week. And that was just on Monday night. I, I feel like I always have to take time to remind people that Penn State basketball stinks. Yeah. Yeah. Like, <laughs> basement of the big 10 every year i mean yeah i, I don't know um tuesday uh, another um kind of uh you know up and down graph of a, of a day uh richmond over georgia state 
uh, by a lot. Uh, Memphis takes care of your our Billikens. Uh, and then, I mean, you got Cal State Fullerton whipping George Washington. Yeah, at least that one was out on the road, though. Um, yeah. But I think we kind of know George Washington's in for a long season. It was interesting to see, you know, George Washington and uh, Davidson both went on the road all the way to California. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Davidson and uh, where, where were they? San, San Francisco. Francisco. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, uh, Curry land. Right. Talk to me about Wednesday, though. I mean, holy moly! Yeah, Wednesday was a wild. <laughs> Wednesday was a wild night. Um, so you've got you've got Rhode Island that takes care of business against Boston College, and we had some great opportunities here because we're playing you know three power conference teams. George Mason gets the upset over a ranked Maryland team that was um, I think number twenty or twenty one at the time. Uh, yes. And then VCU goes on the road and wins a brutally ugly football score of a game 48 37 over Vanderbilt um two teams that are just apparently just going to struggle to score this year so we, we look at that and we've got okay three power conference games um all on the road and all wins and then we <laughs> and we turn to Dayton who gets uh blown out honestly by Lipscomb and um LaSalle goes on the road to Delaware, loses in overtime. And then you've got uh, St. Joe's, who I think is another team that's in for a long season, uh, loses a cross-town rivalry to Drexel. So three really nice wins and three really bad losses. Yeah, just, I mean, this conference, man. I, I'm past, <laughs> I'm past caring about, like, the net. Like, honestly, I just want to see the world burn in this conference, except for SLU. Like, I mean, it's, it's our, like, it, I mean, Davidson is going to do this thing where they lose to like New Mexico state by nine and then go and beat Bonaventure yeah. twice, twice, probably. Right. Yeah. Bonaventure um, who beat, uh, you know, Boise state on Thursday um, in Charleston. Um, and apparently they've brought their entire alumni base to Charleston. They're just having a blast down there um they're going to be really i think the only other team that we're going to be able to rely on this season you know um if if dayton's going to be any good it's going to take a while to come together um they've got a lot of young talent um some of these other teams i just don't know yet who they are so i i think i think we just really need bonaventure to be that rock solid team this year yeah uh, speaking of bonaventure uh they i mean they're They've had a hell of a weekend in Charleston. Yeah. Yeah. Like I mentioned, they beat Boise state, um, you know, the same night that uh, UMass drops to uh, Weber state. And uh, I believe they wound up winning this whole thing. They, the next day they go to uh, they, they, they face Clemson and win by three. Um, and then do I have this right? Did they, uh, was They're that up it? by 20 right now? They're up by 20 right now. Okay. 24.6 so, seconds to go. I think they're good. Yeah. So, and that's against Marquette in the final of this thing. So yeah, Bonaventure is, um, is who they thought is who we thought they were. They're, they're quite good this year. Uh, you know, Davidson beats Penn, UMass beats Greensboro. Uh, then Duquesne drops it, drops 16 point decision to Northeastern, not Western Eastern. Mm. Uh, Fordham loses to Maryland Eastern Shore. Yeah. Uh, th those who are of a certain age, aka my age, will remember Maryland Eastern Shore as the team you would start with at like College Hoops 2K8 because they were horrible. And, yeah. and nothing has changed in the last 13 years. No, and, and it's worth noting, um, well, not only did Ken Palm have them as a bottom five team to start this season, they did not even play last season. They were one of the programs that just opted out of the entire season. And the year before, they were terrible. They won five games, and only four of those were against D1 teams, um, all in their same conference, which just isn't a very strong conference. So, yeah, this is a bad this is a bad loss, but it's also worth noting that Maryland Eastern Shore went to St. Joe's and took them to the wire. Um, and I think that says a lot more about Fordham and St. Joe's than it does about Maryland Eastern Shore because they're still going to be bad. Yeah, uh, here is a here's a game that I ended up find I was able to find an illegal stream for 
uh, and watch. Uh, and also, I think I, I, I woke up the morning of this game, this Mason James Madison game. I woke up, I see the line is minus three and a half. And I text Carter Chapley. I said, tell me why I shouldn't put a thousand dollars on George Mason to cover. And this is why you don't put a thousand dollars on George Mason to cover three and a half because James Madison wins 67, 64. Thankfully, yeah. thankfully I realized that Vegas had to have known something that we didn't. Yeah. I, that was weird because like, um, had I put in picks for that day and, and trust me, I don't gamble a dime on sports. I don't, I just don't trust it. This is exactly the reason why. Cause I would have looked at that and just thought exactly the way you did like, yeah, easy money. Uh, but James Madison comes away with a three point win here. Yeah. I think the first like 10 or first five minutes of this one, you could just, the way the score was going, like it just was like, yeah, I think James, Matt, it's, I think it's their night. I, I don't know yeah. what it was about it, but uh, uh, UMass Lowell, by the end of this weekend, they're going to be uh, top of the A-10. Yeah, I, I think uh, now is the time. I mean, if we want 16 in the A-10, I think we should forget about Wichita State or Belmont and just add UMass Lowell uh, at, at the top of the America East right now with a 4-1 and one non-conference record and okay. feasting on the A-10. And we can add uh, them. Uh, we can add eight ten hockey. Ooh, that'd, that'd be, be nice. Uh, yeah. Um, Saturday. Uh, you know, I mean, it it just continues to pile up. Uh, yeah. If I if I told you that uh, LaSalle would be one of two Atlantic Ten teams to come away with a win on this day, would you tell me I was crazy? Well, looking at all the other games, I would have said, please let Slew be the other because that was the Mercer <laughs> game. <laughs> um, I can't say I'm shocked. I think if you told me it was LaSalle and one other team, yeah, that would have surprised me because that means some combination of, you know, St. Joe's losing to Monmouth or Richmond losing to Drake or Dayton losing to Austin P, or VCU losing to Chattanooga. Uh, or Rhode Island losing to Tulsa. All of these things happened. And I just, I would have been shocked that more than two of those happened, or honestly, more than one. Um, the only non surprising result was Colorado over Duquesne, which I thought would have been a blowout, and Duquesne uh, took them to overtime. Um, so I, yeah, this, this was just a brutally bad night for the conference. Yeah, we got to see Drake, though, who we're, we're going to tangle with later in yeah. Vegas. I, yeah. I wasn't overly impressed by Drake. No, which speaks to how, how bad Richmond was. You know, like earlier this week, they go out and score uh, 94. And then, um, and then yeah, lose, lose by three to Drake. Are they, are they erecting billboards in Richmond yet? <laughs> oh god i mean the, the, the other ones to have to be in a closet somewhere right it's one hell of a closet <laughs> the rolled up folded up whatever yes yes uh today uh sunday the 21st uh I, i'm you know average day i uh, bet better days yeah you gotta i like um you know rhode island over boston college here and um you know, Davidson over East Carolina. I think that's that's one they've got to get, which is which is nice. UMass dropped one to Ball State. Um, the, you know, had a had a rally that came up a little short, 80, 89, 86. Um, seems like defense is just gonna be a problem for them. And then it looks like Bonaventure is winning this uh, Charleston classic. So that's that's a great result. Um, and so I don't know. I mean, you know, Bonaventure looks great. SLU is kind of, uh, you know, the record we thought they'd be right now. Rhode Island looks pretty good, but there's a lot of teams in this conference. I just have no idea who they are yet. Yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be interesting. Um, yeah. We'll move on to women's basketball. Uh, the women had a tough weekend. They played some really good teams. And I, and I think we're going to, this is going to be a running theme with women's basketball, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, I just don't think. I, I don't even think we really need to get into the games. I mean, I'd love to, you know, cover them, you know, down to the minute. But again, you, you lose 69-53 versus Mizzou at home. Mm -hmm. Then you go to Kansas and lose 79-50 at, you know, at, in Lawrence. Um, 
I just, this isn't a complete team. Uh, I think Rachel losing Rachel Kent to the transfer portal and then Miriam Smith Triore. Uh, I mean, those were your two studs last season. I think it, it just high level on the Mizzou game, they get out rebounded 47 to 31. So yeah, what's the missing piece there? Maybe somebody who averaged almost 10 rebounds a game last year. Um, and then the other thing, they go three for 18 from three. So yeah. if you're not going to rebound, you've got to hit your threes and uh, you can't, you can't suffer that badly in both of those columns. Yeah. I mean, in Kansas, I mean, this is a, a team that uh, we've actually played well against uh, in, in more recent uh, years, but uh, they're four and in the big 10 or four and uh on, in their non-conference. Uh, they they handled this one from the get-go. Yeah, this is another night where um, Slew is just brutal uh, shooting the three. And that's something that the loss of Smith Traore should not affect as much. But um, all their starters went to combined uh, 0 for 17 from three. And um, you just, you're just not going to win many games when that happens. Um, you know, they lose the rebounding battle here, not by as much. Um, but I do... You know, even though Kansas women's basketball is not as dominant within, you know, women's basketball as the men's program is in men's basketball, um, what you tend to run into against more of these power conference teams is they're just they're, they're just bigger. They just are a little bit bigger and more athletic. And um, and I think that gap has kind of hit slew a couple times here early. Uh, we'll move on to happy times in Billiken land. Uh, men's soccer. Uh, what what a what a day that was for Kevin Kalish, for uh, the seniors, for the entire Billiken soccer team, uh, for Chris May, for Janet Oberly, for all these people that uh, may that that you know have built this program back to where uh, to a ten seed in the NCAA tournament. Uh, you oh. The, Herman Stadium was overflowing with people. It looked like a 1930s first division game in England or like the old pictures of, uh, of the World Cup when people are, you, you get, you, everybody, there's no like risers. They're just standing on the sidelines. Like that's what it looked like. It was unbelievable. Yeah, it was. Um, the reported crowd here was 6,815, but seems like what from what you had to say and what it looked like on the on the the broadcast it looked like that was a pretty conservative estimate yeah i mean look like i i know it, I, I think at least 10 people talked about how do we like there's no way we actually need a ticket to get into the game because you i mean people were just walking in it, yeah. it was it, it was crazy i mean people started showing i mean that people started filing in an hour before and it did not stop. Uh, I mean, there was a massive tailgate on top of Olive Compton. Uh, a lot of SLU alumni and family and friends were up there. Um, uh, the alumni were all out. Uh, Robbie Cristo was out. Uh, Alex Sweet and Mike Robeson. Um, you know, and I, everybody came out for this one. Um, the entire city, it was it really was a St. Louis soccer reunion. That really what is what this turned into. This is one that they they really hyped on social media leading up to it. Like, let's sell this thing out. Let's break a record. Let's get as many people there as we possibly can. And you never quite know what's going to happen um, until the event actually takes place. But people came out. I mean, this was a great game, you know. Um, I, right before we sat down to record, um, my, my friend, Tim texted me, I took the family to uh, the soccer game today. What a performance. Couldn't believe those goals all highlight real goals. He said his daughter loved it and was literally in tears when they told her it was time to go. Um, which is just perfect because right there, they just landed, you know, a fan for life. She's yeah. four or five years old and, and super excited about this thing. And, you know, we tweeted out earlier today, SLU rewarded the people who showed up in force today with about as good a performance as you possibly could have put together in the second round of an NCAA tournament. I mean, it, from the jump, I mean, the bill, you, it, it, 
there was some nerviness in that, you know, LIU was just trying to toss the ball up to their two big forwards and hope that things got weird and the ball ended up in the net. And that really was kind of how they scored their only goal. Um, but yeah, I mean, the crowd was outstanding. Um, uh, you couldn't go, you know, for those that, that spend time within the St. Louis soccer community, you couldn't go five feet without seeing somebody, you know, uh, it was very, it was so St. Louis in that way. Um, yeah. But all the goals were beautiful. The John Klein, uh, the first goal in the fourth minute off a of Chandler Vaughn cross. Uh, I mean, that touch, the touch of an angel off the chest to settle that one down and, and, and find the net after being hassled by two defenders uh, and yeah. the goalie was just unbelievable. Yeah, it was incredible poise. He's a smaller player and to, to just show that much control in traffic you know, two guys basically hanging on him. It was um, just a just a savvy, smart, poised veteran goal, off a great cross too. Perfect um, cross by Chandler. The 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 diagonal uh, passes through the air in this game were just, I mean, ninety percent of them were just on point. Yeah, uh, they were throwing darts from from the wings to the to the targets up up top. Sixteenth uh, minute, John Klein. From Isaiah Parker and AJ Palazzolo, the, the, uh, just a, I mean, like, um, the majority of goals in in college soccer are ugly as sin, mm -hmm. but I mean today the the goals were just gorgeous. Uh, a diving, when was the last time you saw a diving header in college? I mean, you don't. I was trying you, to think about. You don't that see a diving the, header no. in the pro ranks very often. No. No, I mean, it, it, I was trying to think at SLU, have I seen a diving head? I could not think of one off the top of my head. I'm sure there, there oh, are some. There has but, to be. But, uh, but yeah, he just uh, he just placed that perfectly. What a gutsy play. And, like, he's he's been the setup man all year. And then today he goes out and really earns both of those goals. Uh, Christian Buendia in the 21st minute from Simon Betcher. Uh, this was kind of similar to that uh, – that goal in the A-10 final, the seeing eye shot, except this one uh, had a little more power behind it. Yeah, it did. It was, um, it had a little more to do with uh, how he struck it and not necessarily the circumstances around it, but, but Betcher settled it down and then just kind of served it up on a platter and Buendia's left foot took care of the rest. Uh, as I, uh, as I alluded to earlier, uh, LIU got back, got one back and, I mean, you felt there, there was no there was no concern in the crowd after that goal was scored either. I mean, uh, Robert Winkler takes a free kick. It, it glances off a Billiken head, uh, catches Schulte leaning and, and slipping, uh, and, and Schulte's not able to get back to it, and it, it kind of just uh, rolls into the net. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're right. It felt like an aberration and not something that was really a, a concern at this point. Already down 3-0 when they score it. Uh, 47th minute, Simon Betcher from Patrick Schulte, something you don't see very often uh, in, in soccer. Um, a crafty finish off the outside of the left foot or outside of the foot. Uh, kind of a half chip that just kind of, uh, it bounced in. Just kind yeah. of in. Yeah, he, he, it was more about timing here and the fact that he's so good scoring on the outside of his foot. He's been doing that all season long, um, you know, trying to catch teams off guard. And he just kind of put it just in the right time and place, didn't need to put much on it at all because he had so much behind his run, uh, which was so impressive, you know, to beat these, uh, beat the defenders down the field and get this. Um, but yeah, just, just well placed. What, one of our running jokes uh, with men's soccer is stop us if you've heard this before. Simon Betcher from AJ Klein. But this time, stop me if you've heard this before. AJ Palazzolo on a half volley, upper 90. Yeah, that was uh, – <laughs> oh. it was one where he could have had it right at his foot, but he just kind of chipped it up to himself to give – you know, to, to, to yeah. take the half volley. And uh, – he loves that. I mean, it's like he just gets that's that's his sweet spot is if the ball's kind of a foot and a half in the air. Um, another outstanding game on the defensive side of things uh, for Kip Keller. I mean, this kid just I, I, you need 
four hands. You need to use your hands and toes, uh, your fingers and toes to count the amount of times he's bailed out. Uh, he's been the last man and, and bailed out the Billikens. Uh, just another great game. And uh, he had a rip that I swear, like, I thought this one was going in that, that, that sailed just high. Uh, he was fantastic. Yeah. Uh, that, that dude, Isaiah Parker was the lead all night. Uh, LIU had no answer for the Billiken wings. Um, like I said, Parker, he torched his man anytime he had the ball within 25 yards of goal, uh, you know, cutting in from the sideline. So um, that, yeah, it was, just, they got, the Billikens got to the, to the touchline or the end line all night. They, they weren't being stopped. LIU had nothing. So they, they didn't have it defensively. Yeah. And, and back to Keller, a lot of the, you know, we've, we've been, lauding this team all season long for kind of their attacking offensive just super confident aggressive style that they play you can't do that unless you have somebody like kip keller back there um who's just that rock solid and the fact that he's only a sophomore i just i love that <laughs> i think this yeah. team's going to be good for a while um with him back there and just overall um this performance you know, when you hype up a game this much, let's sell it out. Let's get everybody, you know, out there. Um, you kind of have to deliver the goods. If they had just played a boring, you know, defensive pack it in kind of style, um, they could have left a lot of people disappointed. But, um, you know, just the way this team plays, it's like uh, we're going to make good on this deal. But who knew they were going to score five goals? And it felt like it could have been six or seven. Yeah, you mentioned uh, five goals. Uh, this was the most goals scored by any team in the first or second round game so far. And that's as of me doing these notes at like four o'clock in the afternoon. So uh, it's possible. There was a game that had four goals uh, by one team, but I, I'll have to take a look at that. Um, the attendance, uh, like we said, was announced at 6,815. Uh, and and it, it felt so much bigger um just uh, you, there were so many times in this game where the billikens uh put defenders on skates that the crowd uh like oohed and odd and you could uh you could just feel that and it was crazy i i, I haven't seen anything like that in a long time yeah I, I i guess i should add to our notes that since then uh hofstra did wind up beating penn state eight to two Oh my uh, God. Yeah. Which is technically an upset because Penn state was the number 12 overall seed and Hofstra is not seeded. Um, and then the team that they'll play next uh, Pitt beat Northern Illinois five to two. That so was the one that I was looking at. Yeah. I but, didn't even uh, see Hofstra. Yeah, I know that's, that's pretty crazy, but, um, but otherwise, yeah, this, this is the, um, you know, I guess tied for the second most goals so far in the tournament. Eight to two. I know. <laughs> against a, against a team that was supposed to beat you. I'm gonna have to look through that. Um, Billikens are heading to the Sweet Six. Yeah, well, you know what? I, I want to say one more thing. Um, and this isn't a, a dig at, 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 at anything in the soccer program, but you know, it, it's hard when for so many years, like people are kind of kids can run rough shot over the uh the stadium because not and no that not not many people are there and it doesn't matter but i feel like when you're expecting to have six thousand eight hundred fifteen people there you know six to seven thousand uh I, I would like to see them add ushers or some sort of uh you know pseudo security um because i mean you just had a lot of people walk like when you don't when you have bleachers that go all the way down to the the concrete or the grass like people walking in front of you is brutal um and, and of course kids are running up and down the bleachers constantly uh, and when they do there's more of them now because it there's about seven thousand people so I, I really would like to see them maybe take a look at that uh the next time they try to do this um or hopefully when we host a uh elite eight game possible because we're not gonna host a sweet 16 game we'll get into the the permutations for which that could be possible um up next is the sweet 16 at seven seed duke blue devils uh they avoided disaster today uh, a 2-1 win versus ucla 
they gave up an early goal to the Bruins and then uh, uh, within the last 10 minutes of regulation scored two goals and uh, they, they knocked UCLA out of the tournament. Um, you're going to see high pressure from Duke. Uh, and, and if the Billikens can, can absorb it and take advantage, I, I don't see why the Billikens can't go to the Elite Eight. Um, uh, they're led by uh, Thorlifer Olferson. Ulf, did I, how did I do? Yeah, let's go with that. Yeah, 14 goals on the season. Uh, Duke scores uh, 2.1 goals per game and gives up uh, a goal even per game. Uh, I don't see any reason why the Bill, I mean, the Billikens are rolling right now. Yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of wild. Duke uh, wins two to one, which is exactly their season average score. But that's, <laughs> I mean, that's, well, I mean, that's not a season average score that scares you, right? I mean, it's, it's not a team that scores three or more goals a game. It's not a team that shuts everybody out. Um, they're just really solid. They're, they're, they're a good team, but yeah, you're right. There's nothing here that necessarily scares me. Um, I think the one thing that I would be worried about is we see a game like, uh, and look, I haven't seen Duke play all year, but maybe they look at a game like Fordham, uh, where a team just kind of plays really solid. They, they know what we're going to do. They play really solid, um, you know, park it in front of the net defense all, all game and kind of force this thing into, uh, into overtime and, and maybe anything happens. So that's the one thing I kind of worry about is if the game kind of goes that way. Um, but otherwise, I, I just, I, you know, obviously I'm biased and this is the team that I've seen play all season long, but um, I just love what SLU is doing right now. And, and I, I, yeah, I feel good about this one. Yeah, I'm excited. Uh, I, I as, as much as it pains me that we're not going to have a home game because I would love to tailgate again, yeah. do all that fun stuff. It, it's going to be nice to sit down on the couch and watch this one, I think. Yeah. Um, uh, there's something about watching these games on TV and them being big. It just feels like uh, you're, you know, uh, dealing with a, a, a big time pro league, I guess. Right. Yeah. Do we have a game time for this one yet? No, we don't even have a game day. It could okay. be Saturday All or right. Sunday. It hasn't officially been announced that it's going as of right now. And, you know, we record on, uh, oh, actually, you know what? They just threw it up on the, that's crazy. Since, since we've been talking, it's on the official site. Now we are playing Saturday, the 27th, uh, 6 PM St. Louis time, central time, um, in Durham at Duke. So that is all official now. So it's Saturday the 27th? Saturday, this t- Saturday the 27th at 6 p.m. Central. And, and the good news is it does not uh, conflict with any other Billiken events. So right. um, that, that's good. Uh, and I'm sure it'll be on the AC. It, it will probably, it, it, it very well could be on ACC Network. Uh, yeah, the the over the air channel. Right. Um, yeah, so- that's possible. That would be that would be awesome. Uh, more people would be able to see it then, I think. Although I don't know how many people don't have ESPN Plus. I I, I, I can't know. imagine not being being a SLU fan. If you're listening to this podcast and don't have ESPN Plus, what are you even doing? Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I mean, it's the it's the, like the best bargain in streaming by a mile. Um, the one thing I do want to add: this will actually already this is official. This is the farthest. SLU has been in the um, NCAA tournament since 2003 um, when they lost in the quarterfinals uh, to Maryland at Maryland four to two Um, in the third round, they beat Washington in overtime. So um, officially the farthest they've been furthest they've been in the tournament uh, in 18 years. So uh, it's great to see SLU kind of getting that magic back. Uh, I'm trying to find, I'm trying to pull up the bracket because I want to get into the permutations because I did promise that I would explain how yeah. we could host a, an elite eight home game. with. with well, as, as we were running. speaking, another final just came in. It was uh, number two overall seed Washington, which is on the, the bottom of the bracket. They're the, the top seed in our, um, in our bracket. They beat Portland three to one. So Washington will host Indiana, uh, which is the number 15 overall seed this weekend. So um, 
it, it, I, I think the permutations you were going to get into is if number two Washington wins, we'll, we'll likely travel there. Uh, but if Indiana wins, we could be coming back to St. Louis if obviously we get through Duke. Yeah, and, and I think uh, as many uh, St. Louis soccer fans know, Indiana always has St. Louis flavor to it. Uh, assistant right. coach, uh, actually he's the associate head coach, Kevin Robeson, brother of Michael Robeson, uh, who played at St. Louis University. Um, they've got Lucas Hummel from Fenton, Missouri. Um, I mean, just I mean, Glenn Carb at Illinois, Lawson Redmond, uh, Joey Mayer, uh, Caseyville, Illinois. Um, I mean, there's always St. Louis for Nathan Gabri from Wildwood. Uh, yeah, I, I, it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting to see uh, how this goes. Yeah, it's also kind of history on the line. I kind of like this uh, th this angle is that. Um, Indiana has the second most titles in, in history to SLU. Theirs have all been a more recent, you know, SLU hasn't won since the seventies and they've got a basically eight since then. So uh, it would be, you know, if, if Indiana manages to upset Washington, um, it would be nice to have a chance to, uh, to be the team that ensures they don't put a ninth star on their crest. We'll move on to women's soccer. Um, they, they gave it their best. I'm going to be honest. There's nothing wrong with this loss. Um, normally, I am upset, and I did kind of walk away with the, from this game at, at 3 nothing. I'm going to be honest with you, uh, because it was a bummer. I, it was more just me being bummed out that they lost than being upset that they lost. Um, a 4-0 loss at Rutgers. Uh, this Rutgers team was unbelievable, Pete. The um, from the jump, the speed of of Rutgers stood out, and then by the time they scored their first goal in the fourth minute, the skill yes. uh, was pretty obvious. Not necessarily for all eleven on Rutgers, but uh, from from an, enough, like the top half of their roster or starting you know lineup seemed to be just another level of skill. Like like their best players to me look like future women's pro players. Yes, and, and they definitely are. And I think I think some of their – it felt like some of the, the uh, space that Rutgers had was self-inflicted by the Billikens. Um, I thought the Billikens um, were, were very aggressive, uh, but they were swinging their legs at the ball. Yeah. Um, and I felt like it made it all that more easy for a, a more talented Rutgers team to kind of dice them up um fourth minute amira ali gets her 10th the season from frankie tagliaferri and riley tiernan uh and the billikens played pretty well they weathered that first half uh one nothing going into halftime uh again four minutes into the second half riley tiernan gets her seventh from amira ali uh and then 20 minutes later in the 69th minute tiernan gets her eighth this time assisted by emma mizal uh, 79th minute, Kylie Dagley uh, gets her third of the season, and that's all she wrote for the women's soccer season. Yeah, it felt really lucky to be down one nothing at halftime. Mm -hmm. um, it was one of those where you know we're outshot 14 to three in the first half. Um, you know, uh, Piricelli makes eight saves. You're just kind of like, oh my god, you know what just what did we just run into? Yeah. second half you're hoping you think but but at the same time you know one nil like okay i mean maybe just maybe i mean i've seen stranger i've seen plenty of soccer games where the team that dominates does not come away with a win anything's possible um but of course you know four minutes into the second half uh when they go up two nil it kind of feel, that that's where it kind of felt insurmountable on the you know the next two goals just kind of felt like formalities it, it really did feel like watching like fifa like that's like a game like people playing fifa like yeah. that's how easily they they connected passes that's how easily they uh dice they you know they they sped through to the defense uh with the ball at their feet uh it, it just it, it they're on another level um yeah they the women finished the season 13 9 and 1 7 and 3 in conference i think uh one of the 
biggest notes is that the top eight in minutes played this season, two seniors, only two. Yeah. So um, not, I guess what Frederick and Halverson. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so look, the future is bright. They're still going to be the program to beat in this conference for the foreseeable future. Yes, absolutely. I see no reason why uh, next year shouldn't be the fifth, uh, fifth straight NCAA yeah. tournament. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I think that's got to be the expectation. And then, you know, look, the, like, like you said, there's, there's, there's no shame in this one. This was just a really, really good Rutgers team. Um, I can't believe they have three losses this year, to be honest with you. Um, the, you know, what, from what we saw with that team, it was like, my God, they're just next level. They, they really are going to be um, very much in the mix for this title. Uh, so, you know, we'll see what happens, but, but hats off to SLU. And the fact that they got a tournament win this year is great because they're coming off three kind of frustrating outcomes in a row in the tournament where they get there and uh, didn't come away with a win in any of those. So um, they, they won their first round this year and they did it on the road and they did it against a power conference team um, after suffering through a pretty tough uh, up and down season. So, you know, I, I really like the, the way that they stuck with this and didn't quit on it at any point in the year. Yeah. Well, I guess we gotta, we gotta switch to volleyball, don't we? Uh, yeah, I guess we have to. Yeah. We're gonna, we're gonna finish up volleyball here. Um, the Billikens end their season in the first round of the eight ten tournament, an extremely disappointing loss. Uh, three, two versus Fordham in Pittsburgh at the UMPBC center, uh, whatever it's called. Uh, they finished the season 18 and 12, 11 and five in conference. Uh, just as I predicted, um, you know, that look, this is a, this is a program that over 10 years under Kent Miller has not finished above third. Um, you know, I, I think, the best thing you can say about, I, and I'm stealing this from somebody and I won't say who said it because I'm just not going to say, uh, the best thing about Kent Miller is he's unoffensive. <laughs> uh, yeah. He really is just, he doesn't, he doesn't move the needle. He goes about his business and he finishes third um, in a bad conference. Yeah. He's, I, I honestly think it's impossible to get fired from St. Louis University Volleyball. It might be. Who knows? I don't know uh, what his contract situation is or anything like that. But uh, but it's pretty clear at this point that this is not the person who's going to um, win the, this conference. Yeah, I, I think um, like I said, I tweeted after the game uh, in, in, in a mildly inebriated state. There's three questions you have to ask. Uh, what are the program's expectations? What are you willing to pay to meet those expectations? And is Kent Miller the best you can do at the amount you're willing to pay to meet those expectations? Yeah, I, I, don't, um, I don't know enough about the, the market for a college volleyball coach or anything like that. Right. But I got to think that last answer is no. I got, I got, you got to think there's somebody out there who can, who can do a little bit better. Yeah. Um, I get that maybe you wanted to move away from Ann Cordes uh, as far as the, the, her style. Uh, she was brash. Um, she could be downright mean, um, yeah. you know, when it comes to practices um, and, and, you know, how she spoke to players. So, yeah. um, you know, and so you move to a guy like Ken Miller, who's quieter, uh, a little more reserved. Uh, but if he is retained through 2022, he will be the longest tenured volleyball coach in program history. And that blows my mind. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's, what can you say? What can you say? I, I just, just, I can't like, that's, that's crazy to me that he's been here. He will have been here longer than, uh, than Marilyn Nolan. Yeah. That's pretty crazy. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I just, I gotta think that, uh, that it, it can't be that much longer. I, th I mean, yes, they're probably not going to eat somebody's contract in this program, but you got to move on at some point. 
these pictures coming out of Herman Stadium or coming out on uh, Slu Men's Twitter, Slu Men's Soccer Twitter account, man. I need these on like a canvas. So if anybody can make that happen, I'll pay whatever it takes. Uh, just yeah. shoot us a DM for crying out loud. Like I get, I get angry, and we're gonna finish this 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 podcast this episode on a rant. I get angry when I go into Rally House. I get angry going into Rally House all the time anyway. Because that the 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 bells that they put on the door drive me insane, um, but it's late, guys. I'm I'm winging it. Uh, but they always have those law those long panoramic pictures of like the Scott Trade Center sold out Blues game. Yeah. Uh, or like, uh, and then of course they'll have a Mizzou one, and I'm like, can we not get a Billiken basketball one? Can't we just do one one time? Like. Yeah. I mean, it would be just sweet to hang out. Like, I don't know. Maybe my expectations are too high. I have no idea. But yeah. um, I think that's all for us, unless you have uh, anything you want to leave the uh, the listeners with. Yeah, you know, I spent a little bit of my uh, free time this past week um, updating all of the recruiting information that I, I, I kind of keep a, a, if you want to call it a database or whatever, of everybody that SLU is recruiting, either that we've offered or in some way, shape, or form shown interest in, um, in the four high school classes. And that I, I also throw JUCO players in there. Um, so if you go to Billikens.com, go to the main forum, and a, one of the pinned threads at the top of the forum is called Recruiting Lists. Click on that, and basically anything you want to know about SLU recruiting, who we're recruiting, who we're recruiting, um, who else is recruiting that player, where they're from, their size, position, uh, what's going on with them lately, and kind of a little scouting bio for everybody um, that we've either offered or shown an interest in um, in the next four classes is there. And I've just, all of the information is up to date as of the last uh, week, week and a half. So um, if, if you ever are curious as to what's going on with recruiting, go there. I put as much as there as I can. And if there's anything that's really interesting that really stands out as somebody's visiting or something like that, if there's a new offer, we'll, we'll definitely tweet about it. We don't tweet every update recruiting wise, cause it's just too much, but um, just wanted to direct people's information or attention there because there's a lot of information that's uh, you know, you can refer to at any time. And, and guys, Peter is absolutely the, the recruiting expert. I mean, it's it's incredible that how in depth he goes and and what he pulls out of his ass for these for these recruiting uh, uh, lists. So go check him out. Um, we really should put him on the Twitter account. <laughs> but we love you guys, so we, we you know we we give it to you uh, on the message board. So um, anyway, that's all for us. Uh, don't forget to follow us on all social media. Make sure you. Uh, like subscribe rate you know if you go to the apple store you know subscribe to all of our all the phones in the apple store on our um on the you know on the podcast app uh thanks for listening i'm at zach miller mmp pete's at peter's a tweeter and our podcast is midtown mad pod on twitter uh thanks for listening guys go bills go bills (laughs) 